Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first panel discussion for the Disease Prevention and Control Summit. We've got um, the One Health panel here talking about COVID-19 and um, insights from the One Health world. Can I ask all of the panelists to turn their cameras on, please? And I'd like to introduce our moderator, Peter Rabinowitz, who is the director of the University of Washington Center for One Health Research. Thank you, Joan. And it's, uh, it's great to be here and it's, um, it's it, to be part of this conference and to be working with a, a really uh, distinguished group of panelists. The goal of the session um, this morning is to talk about the One Health perspective on, on disease and disease prevention and to see how that applies to the current COVID-19 pandemic as well as to other pandemics in the future. So my, um, my background is I'm a physician at the University of Washington. I direct the University of Washington Center for One Health Research and also co-direct uh, the University of Washington's Alliance for Pandemic Preparedness. So my interest is in um, emerging infectious diseases as well as zoonotic diseases, ones that go between humans and animals, and we'll be talking more about that. So Greg, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, sure, Peter. I'm Greg Gray. I'm a professor at Duke University, Duke Kunshan University in China, and Duke in U.S. Medical School in Singapore. And I manage uh, teams doing One Health research at all three sites. That's all. Great. And Catherine, I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Catherine Michalaba. I am policy advisor and research scientist at EcoHealth Alliance based in New York City. I have a, a PhD in planetary and environmental health sciences. And for the past 10 years, I've worked on the USAID supported PREDICT project, which is looking at emerging infectious diseases. So I'm really excited to be on this panel and with you all. Thank you. Great. And Laura? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Kahn. I'm a physician and research scholar at Princeton University. Um, I teach a course called uh, Bats, Ducks, and Pandemics. That's a Coursera course that's uh, available online for free. Um, I do research in antimicrobial resistance, emerging diseases, and leadership during pandemics, and I will be hosting a roundtable tomorrow for those who are interested. Thank you. And Sharon. Good morning. Yes, I'm Sharon Deem, and I'm a wildlife veterinarian and an epidemiologist. Currently, I'm the director of the St. Louis Zoo Institute for Conservation Medicine. I also teach One Health semester courses at WashU in St. Louis and the University of Missouri. And really, my career has focused on diseases shared between human and non-human animals, as well as many of the environmental impacts that are really threatening biodiversity conservation. Glad to be here. And Cheryl. Hi, Peter, and hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Stroud. I am a veterinarian. I have a PhD in endocrine physiology. I've been leading the One Health Commission as executive director since late 2013. The One Health Commission really works in the global One Health community to help connect us so we have a, are able to raise our voices in common in support of this um, concept of One Health, this approach that we really think is truly a ray of hope for the future. Um, we are really focused very much on education, and that's education cradle to grave. Um, we're trying to reach um, very early ages with One Health education and education about One Health topics, as well as lawmakers and policymakers and the public. So I'm looking forward to this discussion very much. Great. So why don't we start the discussion? And for the audience, uh, I want you to know that your questions are very valuable. Um, there's going to be a way to put your questions into the uh, the chat or the swap screen function, and we're going to spend the last 10 minutes of the session trying to answer some of those questions. So please, um, please come up with questions and, and send those to the panelists. But what we're, we're going to do is um, demonstrate the, what a One Health approach is by taking this multidisciplinary panel and taking a look at COVID-19 and the current pandemic from three different perspectives, from the human perspective, the animal perspective, and the environmental perspective. And you can see how those can be integrated to uh, come up with solutions for not only dealing with COVID-19 issues, but for future pandemics as well. So we're gonna start with the human uh, health perspectives. And Laura, you had a couple slides you wanted to go through. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Peter. I'm going to share my slides. I have a few slides here. I want to give just kind of set the stage for uh, the rest of the speakers um, and give a human health perspective, a One Health perspective on um, zoonotic diseases, specifically focusing on COVID-19. Um, One Health is this concept that human, animal, and environmental health are linked. Uh, and because they are linked, we must examine these complex subjects, such as food safety and security and pandemic zoonotic diseases using an interdisciplinary approach. And I think it's really important to note that most of these emerging diseases, the diseases that are causing pandemics are zoonotic, ranging from Ebola virus, Nipah virus, influenza viruses, going on to SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19, uh, they are all zoonotic. And because they're zoonotic, they're diseases of animals that infect people, we need to work collaboratively across the species divide physicians, veterinarians, environmental health specialists to address these issues. And um, this is a onehealthinitiative.com website. Uh, please visit it and tell your colleagues to visit it as well. It's been serving as a repository for uh, One Health news and information since 2008. I think it's important to point out that uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus that uh, emerged in China has now exploded around the world. And as of this morning, uh, according to Johns Hopkins University, there's now over 16 million cases. The vast majority uh, are in the United States. These are confirmed cases. We don't know how many unconfirmed cases there are. The US has by far the most cases and unfortunately also has the most deaths. Uh, and this website is very useful for tracking the spread of the virus. Now, uh, we in human medicine, we're kind of blindsided by the emergence of SARS, then MERS, and now COVID-19, but veterinarians have been aware of coronaviruses for almost 90 years. And the uh, first coronavirus was described in 1931, avian infectious bronchitis virus in chicks in, Dakota, in North Dakota. And I have a timeline here of the different, some of the, this is a very lengthy timeline actually, this is a truncated version, but it's important to note that the first human coronavirus was identified in 1965-66 and they generally caused mild colds. Um, and uh, the coronavirus itself was classified as a new uh, entity in 1968. But since 1977, you've got the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus exploding around Europe and Asia, uh, origin unknown, Cov bovine coronaviruses and feedlot cattle worldwide, and now SARS. Now, these coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They are famous for sloppy replication, causing frequent mutations like influenza, so they're changing. And they're notorious for jumping to different species. And I have a whole host of different species here. Uh, and you know, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're now being hit hard with these coronaviruses. But if we had talked to veterinarians who are really the key in all of this, understanding these pandemics, uh, we might be better off. Um, Ultimately, though, these viruses are emerging uh, largely either directly or indirectly through our interactions with animals, particularly raising and eating animals. Um, so we need to figure out how to sustainably feed ourselves, maintain our civilization without destroying the natural world and unleashing more of these zoonotic diseases upon ourselves. And really the only way to do that is with a One Health approach where we work collaboratively between physicians, veterinarians, public health professionals, uh, environmental health professionals, wildlife veterinarians, and others. So it really has to be an integrative approach if we want to address these uh, challenges. Uh, just a shout out to my colleagues in the One Health Initiative, uh, pictured here the team, Again, please visit our website, and um, I'm happy to turn the, uh, the uh, speaking over to my colleagues on this uh, One Health and Infection Control panel.
So now thank I have you. to figure out how to stop slide share. And thank you very much. You did it. Great, great. Questions. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So, you know, as, as you mentioned, there's this, um, there are these zoonotic diseases that have been jumping from animals to people. And, it, and, and when we look at it over the last several decades, it appears that there are more and more of these, of these species jumps of really dangerous pathogens. And Greg, I'm wondering if you could go in a little more depth about why, why do we think this is? Why are, why are there more zoonotic diseases emerging? Well, Peter, I think uh, people have wrestled with this uh, for a number of years. There have been some excellent reports out of the Institute of Medicine now, the National Academies of Medicine, chronicling some of the factors we think are contributing to this and similar veterinary literature talking about emerging problems in veterinary, uh, in the veterinary world. Uh, a lot of it, I think, has to do to uh, the increasing populations of humans uh, coming into close contact with animals, both wildlife and domestic animals. And we're doing that because now we can move people, animal and animal products uh, around the world faster than uh, we could uh, have uh, in, ever before in our history. In addition, we have large populations of animals in close proximity to dense populations of humans in, in the cities. And when uh, a pathogen evades the biosecurity in those industrialized farms, well, it just has an opportunity to replicate, replicate, change, and, and, and cause problems. Uh, in addition, you know, our, our ability to detect these and characterize these pathogens has increased, and certainly that's a, uh, an aspect of this. At any rate, it, it, some would argue this is sort of a perfect storm in our understanding of these threats. And, and now we're on the threshold of probably uh, more rapid, more periodic uh, emerging threats. And, and rightfully, we need to be concerned because who knows what is gonna follow uh, SARS-CoV-2? And who knows uh, if we'll be able to respond in the same rapid way we have to this virus. Yeah, and we, we know that the, um we're still a little unclear about the exact origin of this virus, uh, COVID-19. But uh, what are some of the what are some of your thoughts about what could have happened to have this virus jump from animals to humans? Well, I think there's been a considerable debate in the literature about this, and I would say that most virologists uh, don't see this as a episode of malfeasance or manipulation of a naturally occurring virus uh, or an accident. It's uh, somehow this virus, uh, either directly from a bat or through an unknown yet unidentified intermediate host, has uh, taken uh, root in man and become highly efficient. And so uh, while we're still trying to discern that, there, WHO is very concerned. There have been a bunch of editorials, commentaries that we need to study this. Uh, you, you know, the, the big gestalt is how do we monitor for newly emergent pathogens in the same settings at the same human animal nexus? How do we try to intervene before something becomes highly transmissible? And so I think uh, that's the next step while we're still responding to this pandemic. How do we set up surveillance at the human animal nexus in a one health way uh, to, uh, to mitigate the threats that are coming down the road? Great. So I wanna shift from a little more human centric approach to looking at the animals and what they can tell us about, um, about COVID and, and where we're going from here. And Sharon, um, you know, how did you as a veterinarian look at this whole COVID uh, situation, both in terms of animals that you care for with, in a zoo context, but other animals as well? Yeah, great question. So first of all, I'd like to say I love how we've kicked this off. It's really fa fascinating to hear the human, the environmental, the animal, animal side 
I think for this summit, we all have to realize that we are sitting here in our little Zoom boxes because we're in the midst of a pandemic that was a spillover, right, from animals. So this is a zoonotic pathogen that has now become human adapted, right? So now it is, we humans are sharing this pathogen. And we're worried a bit, I think to your question, Peter, we're worried a bit about spill back. So those of us who may be positive with COVID and our relationship with our pets, or as, as we know, there have been uh, at least one instance of sharing from humans to zoo animals, right? So that spillback possibility is there, although this COVID-19 is truly a human adapted pathogen now, after it has spilled over from that relationship we just talked about with 7.8 billion of us and how we feed our population. So I think it's very important that we remember how we got here to be in our little Zoom boxes and, and how we might prevent it from the next disease X or the next pandemic. And, and so from that perspective, we know that there are many different animal species that have different susceptibilities, right? So we know that, for instance, in the Netherlands, many mink farms have been depopulated because of spill up, spill back from their human caregivers to the mink themselves. So this is, this is just one of those examples of how zoonotic pathogens are truly bi-directional, right? Even though, like HIV, this one has become very human adapted. And can we learn anything from the, uh, so some animals are more susceptible than others can we learn anything about looking across species rather than just looking at humans? Can we look anything, uh, can we learn something about resistance to the virus or, or new approaches to, um, to prevention or looking at what susceptibility factors by looking at different species? Right, so two parts to that. One is there are a lot of great researchers today that are really working in the One Health space of comparative medicine, right? So we are, we have a lot of studies going on of looking at coronaviruses as what point, pointed out earlier and the susceptibilities within these different other animal species besides humans, right? So that's the comparative medicine side of One Health. I think the other side that would be really good for more emphasis to be placed on is that ecological side of One Health. So we know there may be 1.7 million undiscovered viruses out there in the other animal species. <clears throat> and because we discover them, that will not give us the answer to stop the next disease spillover. We really need that interface understanding cultural, societal, political, that will really mitigate that ability to spill over of these zoonotic pathogens. Great. And Catherine, you know, you've worked on efforts to find a lot of those new viruses or viruses we didn't know about before in wildlife and, and other animals. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that whole process and, and how you see um, the, the link between wildlife health and this coronavirus outbreak? Yeah, thanks so much, Peter, and, and thanks, Sharon, for making my job easy because, you know, you, you mentioned kind of the, the, um, the common enemy that we face. You know, these 1.7 million viruses out there, um, we know that, you know, only a fraction will be pathogenic to humans, but that could be tens of thousands of viruses, you know, so that, that's, um, that's what we're up against. That's, that's the enemy that we face. The, the wildlife that are reservoirs of these pathogens are not the enemy. You know, they're, they're just kind of living with these viruses the way that, that we do. You know, each species will, will be a reservoir. Um, it's not their fault. You know, it's really these conditions that creates that risk. So if we, we have the wildlife living in natural settings, not coming into contact with species that they wouldn't normally come into contact with, we don't have risk. So really it's these anthropogenic factors that are creating these risk opportunities and allowing for that spillover. Um, which I think there, you know, we, we have a few different entry points to better manage these risks. So one is knowing what's out there. I think that there's value in, in viral discovery because we need to know what we're up against. We need to have this pool of knowledge so that we can detect and really orient, do the situation analysis. We saw that because of 
measures that were implemented post SARS. So think back to 2003 and, you know, this novel virus out there, not a lot of information about kind of what's, what's going on with the situation, made it really challenging to do trace back effectively. There are still a lot of different questions, but ultimately we know because of follow-up work that both SARS and um, the virus that causes corona, uh, COVID-19, you know, these are bad origin viruses. So there might be some intermediaries um, that help transmit it more effectively to humans, but we know that ultimately, um, you know, the, the reservoir is out there and potentially the risk remains for future spillover events of other viruses. Um, again, you know, it's not the fault of, of the bats. We have 1,000 200 or more species of bats, they're all very different. They have different ecological ranges, um, different uh, practices, uh, you know, contribute to ecosystem services. So it's really finding entry points where we can minimize contact with bats and other species to prevent that spillover opportunity. And I think um, there we need to take a few different, you know, approaches. There's not one key solution, but a One Health approach can allow us to detect viruses more effectively and efficiently, um, understand, you know, what uh, increases the likelihood of it being pathogenic to humans and other species, um, and then really find what are the acceptable entry points for reducing risk. So these are uh, maybe very culturally or livelihood specific uh, risk drivers, and we need to know how to go at a specific context, whether that's community or country level, uh, implement the policies that will actually be effective and really create that buy-in for risk reduction. And I, I think that there are a few key projects coming on board. Uh, the World Bank is supporting um, a project in China, really boosting preparedness for, um, for you know, potential uh, pathogen risks and implementing uh, strengthening measures at uh, wildlife monitoring stations. I think this is really exciting because we have existing infrastructure that we can mobilize. And I think that's key for One Health and opportunities. And Catherine, if I could just put you on the spot for a second. You're, you work with an organization that's looking at things like um, wildlife species like pangolins and wildlife trade around the world. We've heard things about um, wet markets, live animal markets. Where, where, where is this going? What do you see as some of the most important things people should know about the, the, our interactions with wildlife and markets and, and uh, how that relates to pandemics? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So if we think of a live animal market, you know, you have a lot of people potentially, so high density of people and then high density of animals. These animals might be multiple species coming in from different settings. You kind of have this perfect mixing bowl, you know, so this, this opportunity for um, pathogen spillover, you have people, you know, butchering animals in the market, you can just imagine kind of the uh, opportunities for, for spillover. Um, typically, very poor hygiene practices. Um, it, so it, it's a perfect interface for spillover, but it's not the only one. So we also have, uh, you know, land use change practices, we have introduction of domestic species in settings which are uh, you know, previously wildlife habitat, so it creates new interfaces. You have extraction of resources, you have um, even ecotourism, you know, people going into cave sites and potentially spreading pathogens from humans or, uh, you know, via our boots, for example. Um, we saw that with the introduction of white nose syndrome, the, the pathogen that causes white nose syndrome here in North America and has led to really catastrophic declines in bat populations. So it's not a one-way road. We, we see that these pathogens are um, opportunistic. So if we create the opportunities for spillover, we're going to see that. And I think we need to really look at the wildlife trade in a very pragmatic way and say, not you know, there's not uniform risk. So eliminating wildlife trade won't solve all of our, our the risks that we face. There's still opportunities for spillover in other contexts. We really need to take a comprehensive approach and I think context specific. And, and Catherine, if I could ask you just to shift our, your perspective for a minute away from just the wildlife to talking about the environment in general, you know, is, is, there, is there a message here about overall environmental change, the way we're handling environments around the world that we should really remember in terms of COVID? Yeah, I, well, I think it's it's a pretty dire situation if we don't take a really comprehensive and realistic look at the way we're changing our our natural habitats, the way we're really encroaching into natural spaces, what that means in terms of the, the risks and impacts that we face into the future. So we know that 
there will be more spillover events. We've seen this with uh, other uh, other pathogens. We've seen, you know, 30 or so uh, spillover events of Ebola virus. We know these pathogens are out there. Um, and we, I think we need to find ways that we can really balance our resource requirements with, uh, with you know, preventing damage that, that can be avoided. We know that practices such as land use change, increased risk, you know, I think we need to be looking at, uh, you know, safeguards from the start. We need to be looking at health impacts, the cost of health impacts, and factoring those into really the cost of development practices, the cost and benefits. We, we want, you know, livelihoods and development that needs to happen, uh, you, you know, but we need to do it in a way that reduces our risk. So kind of minimizes trade-offs and optimizes benefits. Right, and, and other ways that we bring the environment, you know, some of us in human health don't always think about how environmental health scientists can be part of the solution here. And Greg, I'm wondering what, what have you seen in terms of the importance of taking an environmental health perspective on something like COVID? Well, I think you're, you're very right, Peter. Uh, it's, uh, it's at least a three large discipline partnership that's going to help us solve these complex problems like emerging infectious disease, food security, uh, and, and uh, antimicrobial resistance. And often we talk about the human veterinary partnerships, um, uh, but we often neglect the environmental health scientists. And it's pretty clear with all the discussion going on right now with uh, COVID-19, just how important the aerosol biologists are and helping us understand infection control and understanding when we should uh, mask and safe uh, distancing and, and all these things. And so it's been rich to see the application of their tools, often that were created for engineering purposes uh, and have them get into the equations here and help us make a difference in policy. But there are also tools uh, of similar scientists, um, for instance, in water quality, the detection of novel pathogens in large geographical areas can be more efficient uh, if it's a rare pathogen by looking at uh, the nucleic acids in wastewater. And finally, um, you know, there's a whole group of uh, uh, folks looking at sewage itself. Uh, what can we learn about pathogens? We've been working with uh, uh, Joe DeRisi, a UCSF um, a group, and they have basically uh, a, a uh, pipeline of software to look at all the pathogens in a specimen, such that uh, we have a non-targeted uh, discovery, a way to discover new things that perhaps we've never seen before. Finally, let me just say that uh, um, I think uh, Tracy McNamara, who was the veterinarian I guess at the Bronx Zoo that, that helped us in our understanding of West Nile virus and her colleague, Jurgen Rick, in a recent uh, commentary are, are true and saying that we need to look for this COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, that would somehow change and adapt to domestic animals. We need to be monitoring for that because just like it's shown to be efficient in mink and perhaps feline species, it could change and become efficient in other animals and then multiply there uh, in a cryptic way and cause us new problems. And so we need to find ways to work with agricultural industries. Uh, we need to find ways to work with the veterinaries, laboratories that support them in a non-threatening One Health way uh, to discover these things before they become a problem. Let me finally say that yesterday in the journal Emerging Infectious Disease, the August issue highlighted this. About 20 years ago, Dutch researchers discovered a virus, human metanumovirus, that was most closely related to an avian pneumovirus. And when they reported it, uh, they thought it was not zoonotic. They did some experiments. And since that time, uh, we've discovered that they were frankly wrong. And there's been uh, yesterday's report uh, in honor of Sharon, some very good um, veterinarians at the Slovenia Zoo 
discovered an outbreak of chimpanzees of this human virus uh, that had killed them and, uh, and basically then documented the virus zoonotic transmission from the chimpanzees to man. So it's that kind of one health, human health, veterinary health, and then environmental health partnerships are gonna help us adjust to the new normal of emerging infectious diseases. Great, and in talking about putting those three perspectives together, um, Cheryl, you've been working on efforts to really get multidisciplinary teams working together around the world on this kind of problem. What, how would you describe the, the, the current state of things in terms of actually getting people to cooperate in this ways? Thank you. Well, as has been pointed out, this One Health movement, if you will, started back in the early 2000s. And I, in my mind, it came out of the ecology and environment sector. They were one of the first groups to say, look at all these diseases that come from animals. One statistic we have not shared yet with the audience, although we've been talking about zoonotic diseases, is that 60% of all known infectious diseases in humans do come from animals. And 75% of the new emerging diseases that we're learning about are coming from animals. So just thought I'd throw that statistic in for the audience because for some people who aren't even familiar with the term zoonotic diseases, it's quite an, uh, an eye opener. So this movement um, for One Health to really bring us together and help us collaborate has been growing from the veterinary sector picked it up and the, the, as Laura pointed out, the, the human health sector um, really said, oh my gosh, they're right, and have been really paying more attention. So if you, um, if you would like an, an impression of how it's gone around the world, you can visit the OneHealthCommission.org webpage and look at the One Health Day maps. There's a, a One Health Day now, an international One Health Day that's been going six, um, since uh, 2016, and you can get a, an impression from where around the globe, across Africa and Southeast Asia, all across Europe, um, Eastern and Western Europe, um, North America, South America, Canada, every continent has groups that are really working to further these collaborations and they're leading events to educate about One Health and One Health issues. Um, so that's really um, been quite, um, quite an appreciation by the world for this. But, and as I mentioned earlier, really our key, to, our key to helping the world understand this and implement this is education, starting very early and going um, all, you know, all the way through, especially to lawmakers. So um, just for the uh, audience awareness, and we may have an international audience here, but because I'm located in the US, I'm more familiar with what's going in, on in the US. And last summer, uh, June and July of 2019, we actually had um, One, Health, uh, One Health Act of 2019 uh, introduced into both our, our um, Senate and our House and our Congress. And um, um, that particular bill would have us create a One Health framework in the United States. So that could have really helped us, I think, if we had that in place uh, here in the United States to have a, a more coordinated approach and have our agencies, our federal agencies, working better together. In the U.S., and I'm pretty sure it's like this in all countries around the world, um, our agencies are really very siloed. Um, CDC deals with human health. The USDA deals with animal health of agricultural economic importance. But one thing that's really been pointed out by our colleague um, Tracy McNamara that Dr. Gray mentioned is that we really don't have any agency overseeing or surveilling what might show up in our companion animals and our domestic animals that are not of agricultural significance and the wildlife. And I'll just give you a real quick example. In 2017, there was an outbreak of flu in cats in a shelter in New York. And nobody was really paying attention, but it turned out to be zoonotic and it jumped to the veterinarian there. And before they realized what was going on, 300 kittens had been adopted, had adopted out of that shelter to families in that area that had to be traced down and found because what if that had turned out to be a pandemic capable virus that was in those cats and kittens. So a really important thing that, in, at least in the US and I'm guessing around the world, we need to put in place um, partnerships, collaborations, not only across our professions, but across our federal agencies that oversee our health. 
so that we are able to um, put in place surveillance systems just, and they don't have to be very exotic or expensive, just mechanisms to get information out of the veterinary sector and into the human sector and have us able to um, monitor and surveil these. Um, so if we're really thinking about infection control practices, I think the first thing people, that pops into their head is, oh, well, how do we control infection in a hospital or a clinic setting? But if you think the big picture, the infection control here is having those um, systems in place, which we don't currently have, that can help us um, monitor these, just like all the other panelists have been saying, surveil it. And in the US, one of our real weaknesses is being able to have mechanisms in place to monitor what's coming in and the wildlife and the domestic animals. Another real quick example is monkeypox that came into this country several years ago through pocket pits. That's a whole nother huge area. Right now there's a bill in front of Congress trying to regulate um, how dogs can come in, can legally come into this country, what kinds of vaccines and exams they have to have. We, we don't have very good controls on that because really there's no agency paying close attention to it. So this collaborations and what's happening all around the world and in the U.S. are incredibly important for us to implement this One Health concept. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, just as we're talking about infection control and we're all learning much more about wearing masks all the time or um, hand washing in ways we didn't do before, but definitely I think what this panel is showing is that this applies in many other sectors as well, including agriculture, including the way we deal with pets, including the way we, we deal with wildlife. So it, it's a theme that's running through that we're having to really um, change our attitudes about the importance of infection control in all ways. And in a way, uh, Catherine was talking about the millions of viruses that are out there, just as we're doing social distancing between uh, each other right now, we have to look at kind of putting some distance between us and the, and the viruses and other pathogens in a healthy way. So I think some of the questions coming in from the audience relate to that. And I, there's, some, there's some tough questions for the panel. And I think I'd like to move to um, talking about some of the audience questions and which relate you know, in this way of how are we going to make some changes to prevent future pandemics. And the, the first one is, um, really about, people mentioned about feeding uh, seven or eight billion people, possibly up to nine billion people. The fact that we rely a lot on animal protein to feed all these people. Um, there's a person who would like to know whether reducing the amount of meat or the amount of red meat could really make a difference um, in the world in terms of deforestation and uh, carbon emissions and pathogens and things like that. So does anyone want to maybe Sharon or anybody else say something about uh, the way we eat and how that relates to our long-term health. <laughs> yeah, I would love to kick this off because I think this truly is a One Health topic. And, you know, our closest relationship for many of us is at the dinner table, right? So that is our closest re relationship with animals. So I know with COVID, we're really thinking about wildlife trade and that is very important. But we have to think about the, the agricultural side and the increase in meat consumption that humans are having. It is having a planetary impact with the methane, with the pollutants, the nitrogen runoff and so forth. It's having biodiversity impacts as those domestic animals move into wildlife places. And it's also having those human health impacts beyond emerging diseases like obesity and diabetes and heart disease and all those diseases of overconsumption of animal products. So to the question, I think, yeah, I mean, we really do need to revisit our relationship, our food relationship with animals if we wanna truly be healthy as a, a human species, but also do the least damage to the planet and the best for the other animal species that share the planet. I think it's a great, a great question for all of us to be thinking about and that relationship. Great. Um, so uh, another question that, that came up is, um, you know, obviously a lot of people on the panel have been working in this field for a while. We've been aware of zoonotic diseases uh, and the idea that, that pathogens can jump from animals to people. Um, but then COVID came so quickly and turned into a global pandemic um, so maybe Greg or Laura, as people who follow this for a while, were you, were you surprised by, were, were we blindsided by COVID, even though we've been talking about this kind of pandemic threat? Um, 
I'm happy to jump in. Um, well, I mean, we don't really think of coronaviruses the way we do flu viruses, at least up until this point. There's been a long history of influenza, uh, but you know, there was a lot of assumption that SARS appeared and then disappeared, and now we don't have to worry about it. But then MERS came along, uh, and now COVID. So I, I think uh, our experience with this pandemic is really going to make us change how we think about coronaviruses in the world, certainly. Um, I want to uh, just quickly go back to the whole uh, discussion on, on meat and animal proteins and, and the environment, because uh, it, it is such a profound issue. Uh, we, uh, every, you know, we interact with our environment by inhaling the air and ingesting food, whether it's domesticated animals or plants, or in some cases, even wild animals or wild plants. We ingest the environment into our body every day. Uh, and, and that is a profound interaction that we generally don't think about, uh, but that is indeed the case. So um, we are made of microbes. I mean, most of our, our bodies are covered with microbes. Our, we have the, our microbiome in our guts, which is as important to our health and well-being as any organ. So we, we don't think about this constant exchange of microbes that are going on, not only within our bodies, but around the world. Uh, I just think it's important to point out that there are now 7.5 billion humans and 30 billion domesticated food animals. Um, there's only about 3% left of wildlife, terrestrial wildlife. And 7.5 billion humans and 30 billion food animals produce trillions of kilograms of fecal matter. Uh, and there was this one great paper by Berendus in Nature Sustainability uh, published about a year or so ago that estimated that humans and all their domesticated animals produce about 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter every year. And that's increasing because our numbers are increasing. And so we are not only changing our biome by our, you know, uh, uh, food preferences, but we are changing the biome of this planet in unsustainable ways. We generally focus just on human fecal matter. Our uh, sanitation systems only address human fecal matter, but much of the fecal matter that's contaminating our food and contributing to um, foodborne and waterborne illnesses is animal fecal matter. Uh, and we're not really talking about that. Uh, all this fecal matter would fill over a million Olympic-sized swimming pools every year. Um, we're not talking about how we're changing the biome of the planet in unsustainable ways. So our wastes are contaminating the soils, the water, the atmosphere. We need to really rethink our whole foundation of civilization if we want to be able to sustain it. And going from that uh, dire <laughs> forecast to just um, uh, what someone in the audience just wanted to kind of uh, hear the, the idea of how did a virus like COVID-19 or sars coronavirus 2 actually get from a bat to a person? So we've heard about horseshoe bats, we've heard about uh, animals in markets, but just as we're thinking about infection control and keeping a distance from viruses, Greg or Catherine, do you want to say anything about how we think a virus gets from a bat to a person in the first place so that we just keep that in mind? Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, I think there have been many hypotheses uh, to, to show possible linkages from bats, uh, urine and feces, uh, getting into a domestic animal and into uh, in demand. Uh, the most curious thing has been the seafood link. I mean, uh, there have been a number of indications that seafood products are somehow in the middle of this, and that makes no sense to to me or what I know. Let me let me go back to something though that was raised earlier, and that is, were we surprised by the coronavirus? I would say that our group has been looking at four different groups of respiratory viruses as potentially causing big epidemics, if not pandemics. Of course, everyone thinks of influenza A, but there's B, C, and D now. 
and of course coronaviruses, but also adenoviruses and enteroviruses, both of which have been shown to cross over. So we have a whole cauldron of viruses we need to keep pulse on, and we need to do, probably do so at the human-animal nexus in a way that's cost-effective uh, and uh, gonna be uh, very valuable for us uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and, and I think there's a reticence right now to do pathogen discovery in industrialized agriculture. They don't wanna know what could be a problem in humans if it could uh, impact their bottom line. And so we have to find ways to mitigate that risk to their financial interests and bringing human technology uh, to helping them solve problems that will eventually help protect uh, humans. Great, and a lot of what we're talking about is uh, you know changing behavior. We've all been changing our behavior <clears throat> related to this pandemic around the world. Um, but we're talking about, you know, changes in food habits and changes in infection control and other settings. Uh, one, of the, one of the audience uh, participants asked about the social science that, that you know, if you're actually going to work on changing societal norms or behaviors, you have to really think about people that study that and social scientists. And, uh, and does anybody want to talk about how that fits into the One Health paradigm because it's not all about just biology and viruses. It has to do with people and what we do. Uh, anybody want to mention that? Well, I'd be happy to take that one, Peter, um, or at least start out with it. Uh, one of the things that people don't realize is that we scientists, the biomedical scientists, we have a lot of answers, but we don't have all the answers. And we're going to have to engage the social scientists, especially around things like behavior and economies. I mean, think of the social sciences or the anthropologists, the economists, the, the psychologists, the behaviorists. And one example of that is if you think about what was happening in 2014, 2015 with Ebola in West Africa, it took social scientists going into those communities that were really struggling with Ebola to help people understand that they could not continue to do their traditional burial practices as difficult and as hard and as painstaking and heart-wrenching as that was because more people were getting infected and that took the social scientists to step in so it's incredibly important that we help more social scientists and right now the commission the one health commission that i work with has a one health social scientist initiative and their meetings are open to the world, and we really invite anybody to listen in and get involved in, in helping that conversation because it's incredibly important. And I think Laura had a comment. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. Um, I mean, as, as Cheryl said, human behavior is not only a major driver in all these diseases, but it also contributes to the spread. And I mean, just the politicization, unfortunately, of wearing a face mask for example, whether one refuses to wear face masks uh, has a, an incredible influence on how widely this virus spreads. The other major concern is uh, distrust of science, distrust of medicine, refusal of vaccines. Um, vaccines are arguably our best strategy to uh, mitigate the, uh, the effect of such a pandemic as COVID-19 to reduce its spread, to contain it. And you can have the best vaccine, the safest, most effective vaccine in the world, but if people don't trust it and they don't trust you and they refuse to take it, then you're no better off. So uh, we really need to address these social science aspects of, uh, of human behavior, uh, of our civilization, um, if we want to, again, have a sustainable future. And that really involves not only education, but I mean, people aren't really um, hardwired for statistics, they're hardwired for stories. And we really need to engage their hearts and minds to uh, appreciate the planet, respect the planet, treat the planet uh, with the, um, with the um, well, the, with the respect that it deserves. It's our only home. Uh, we really need to, um, change our, our whole way of behavior. And it, it can't be more important than, than that. And one other real quick point, Peter, is um, the, the, just the economics. Um, yeah. Over the years, AIDS, which people, many people don't realize was a zoonotic disease originally, has cost the planet something like $453 billion. And the numbers are 
unfathomable, astronomical. And this pandemic we're living right now, what it is costing us just in dollars, not what we've lost in not being able to hug my daughter and some of the other things that we've lost because of this pandemic, just the sheer dollars, the economic factor of what's going on here has to be profound enough to get our attention and have the economists involved in I this, think it in this has. conversation. And we're right at the end of time. And I just wanted to ask uh, Sharon or Catherine to comment. And one more thing, we've been talking about wildlife and all these viruses. How do we avoid making the, the wildlife the bad guys? Um, and, you know, how do we, uh, are we just gonna get scared of wildlife or how are we gonna proceed? We wanna end with that. I'll start, Catherine. If okay. that's okay. And then sure. you, so I love this question, and I think it, it really is so important that wildlife are not marked as the bad guys. And Catherine was very good earlier talking about that relationship. And we need these animals, these wildlife species are doing ecosystem services for free for us every day. If we think about the bats and their, their pollination and their pest control, they are, they are eating mosquitoes that might transmit West Nile virus or Zika, they are busy out there keeping us healthy. So I think we really need to not demonize the wildlife and really look at that anthropogenic or the human drivers of why we are so close to these species. We should not reach for culling of these animals. It will not be the answer. And Catherine, I'm sure you want to jump in too. <laughs> yeah, excellent um, points. I, and I think um, we really have a responsibility when we do our risk communications to effectively convey what's at stake so that, you know, with, with knowledge is power, but if, if we're kind of, you know, raising the risks without solutions that are really constructive and that work with community norms and priorities, I think that we're, you know, there's a lot at stake there in terms of actually doing more detriment than benefit. So we have a, a great example of our uh, teams working with many local partners and going out into communities, conducting behavioral risk surveys, looking at what are the practices that are being taken in people's daily lives that do expose them to wild animals, to domestic animals, to uh, mosquitoes and, and environmental um, contamination and, and looking at, okay, you know, what are some of the trends, pairing that up with antibody testing to look at evidence of exposure, potentially infection, you know, catching um, influenza-like or um, acute febrile illness early so that we can really have a better understanding of what's out there and potentially missed, you know, among the more common diagnoses. Um, and from that, uh, our teams developed a Living Safely with Bats booklet, a visual booklet. It's in uh, 13 different languages and contexts, even the fruit trees that are shown are different based on the region. And it, it's so exciting to see this in use because it's a tool to go into communities which have been engaged throughout the projects that we work on and um, you know, provide insight on risk reduction practices, but also discuss them. So it's really an entry point tool and then say, you know, okay, you know, maybe people in your village do eat bats. So what can we do to reduce the risk, so phase out the really high risk practices, but you know, not leave communities without a food source. That that's not going to be constructive. So finding solutions and also, you know, being sure that um, there's this mutual understanding of okay, you know, we know bats are high risk species, high taxonomic, you know, group as a whole. But don't go out and cut down the mango tree where they roost. You know, just make sure that you're not coming into direct contact and really live in balance with nature. Great, and well, that, Peter, and, and I'm I've sorry, been reminded one more quick I've been reminded we do still have a few more minutes to talk, so this is great. And and Cheryl, if you're going to say something, there was a, a question of really about it, it, how do how does One Health not be a top-down thing with a bunch of experts telling people what to do, but as Catherine was starting to say, really get communities involved and get it into education. What's what's your anybody's thoughts on that? But maybe Cheryl I'll start. Right, I'd love to start. So I have heard. Even among the scientific colleagues, I have heard people make comments like, well, nature has become our enemy. Nature is not the enemy here. We have seen the enemy and it is us. So we need to wake up to some of our practices all the way. I mean, we even have wet markets in the US. Many people don't realize that. So just, just making arrangements or putting regulations in place that all these species are not you know, piled together is, is one thing that we could do. But um, your question about how to make it not top down 
there is a One Hope initiative, which is a One Help for One Planet education initiative that is working very hard now to, and giving groups around the world, individuals around the world opportunities to get involved with education about One Health issues. And that would take it to the public. One thing that I wanted to mention to this group, since this panel is on COVID-19, is if you visit the One Health Commission website, you'll find a page where we have been queuing up COVID-19 and One Health popular media op-eds and commentaries. And there's a reason for that. There's plenty of scientific knowledge that the scientists are gonna pay attention to, but we're needing to reach the public to understand these issues and understand zoonotic diseases and understand where this pandemic came from. So I urge people to go take a look. You can get quite an education. There are over 200 articles from the popular media from around the world. So there is a huge effort and need to take it to the public and not let it just be all of us DVMs and PhDs and MDs telling the rest of the world what they need to do. We've got to help people understand at a very deep gut level what's what we're saying. And we as scientists are not very good at that. It's another reason we need the social scientists. So thank you very much for that question. Sharon, did you want to say anything else about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think there's uh, just is there any uh, resources that people want to make sure we haven't, if we haven't mentioned anything, I think, Catherine, you had something about the World Bank. Um, so this is a good time to, for the audience, if they want to pursue, uh, learn more about the One Health approach, find other resources. Um, Catherine, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. In 2018, the World Bank came out with a One Health operational framework, and it gives a pretty thorough summary of different tools out there and approaches and examples of One Health in practice, which I think is a good starting point. And, and I think when taking on the One Health approach, it's important to remember that this is something that should be value added. It is another tool into the toolkit. And there are different entry points. You know, it's not always the, the same sectors that will be relevant. We need a, a wider approach with economists and anthropologists and many, many others, you know, farmers, veterinary extension services, they all need to be involved, but maybe in different ways and different contexts. So it's another tool. And um, I'm seeing here, you know, on, on the chat box, the Coursera um, resources, these are all free open access. Um, Sharon has a, a One Health textbook um, with an excellent introduction. And the One Health Commission website certainly has um, a suite of tools. So go on there. These should all be on there. And, and it's really a, a rich source of information. And keep adding to the literature base, too. You know, we need more examples and evidence from One Health in practice. And if anyone's interested, the initiative, the One Health um, for One Planet Education Initiative and the One Health the U.S. subgroup of that has been queuing up teaching resources for One Health. So there's actually a One Health education resources. And um, we're also queuing up, in addition to like the Coursera course, there are a lot of other resources that people could tap into if they're looking to bring this kind of information into their curricula at, at wherever, with, wherever they're based. In, in addition to the websites uh, that we've discussed, uh, One Health Initiative, One Health Commission, there are similar websites in the EU and uh, also at least uh, seven uh, scientific journals that have a One Health theme. About three years ago, uh, there was a suite of articles. Uh, Cheryl was first author on a North American article chronicling all the One Health activities in the act academia and in the private sector. So that's a, a good source. And let me just say to the young folks out there who are interested in One Health and passionate about it, uh, right now you can get everything from a certificate, several weeks of effort, uh, an undergraduate degree, a master's, and even a PhD in One Health. Uh, if, you, if you look around in the various different One Health uh, activities, uh, multiple of which are uh, represented here uh, in academic uh, climates. Yeah. Great. So I'll put in the chat box the link to that series of articles that you just referred to, uh, Greg. Okay. On One Health training, research, and outreach. Um, that was done in 2016. We're really needing to do it again. No, that's, it's it's changing fast. So I think it's not a bad idea. And 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 Greg, just as a physician, if if you had a 
person going into medicine who wanted to get involved in One Health, would any recommendations of first steps they would do? Well, I think uh, getting uh, a, a, some training in public health, uh, research training is what I would focus on. I took the broader degree with an MPH and haven't used a lot of that training. Instead, I would get a master's degree with a focus on the biological um, aspects of biostatistics and epidemiology. And then based on that, follow your interests, whether it be um, vector-borne, zoonoses, uh, uh, you know, hu human tropical diseases, and pursue that as a career. And I'm just going to put in a plug for, you know, people in healthcare, in human healthcare, uh, hopefully this session will make you think that as you're treating people, um, they're, how do you think about the animals that those people are in close contact with and how can you maybe shift your practice a little bit to think about some of these One Health considerations? And I'm sure the veterinarians also can think about the humans and any of us working on environmental issues, think about both people and animals sharing those environments. So um, I think we are now at time and I wanna thank all the panelists for all your perspectives. And I think I can speak on behalf of all of us that we're happy if any people in the audience wanna contact us further, we're pretty available. To, you can find our emails and, and we'd be happy to uh, continue the discussion with any individuals. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much everyone else for that um, really great panel. Just a quick plug for another event that we're doing, a Terrapin event. Um, we're running an AMR-focused event virtually on October the 7th and 8th. Um, that's the World Antimicrobial Resistance Congress um, from Terrapin, just have a look. Um, and yeah, that's the end of that session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you.